Hey, John. Hey, what's up, Zach? Uh, for those that don't know, we're, we're doing this uh, again. Uh, anyway, and we were talking, uh, as most musicians do, uh, f- f- furiously and fervently off, <laughs> off mic about, you know, catching up and, and getting to know each other. Because we don't know each other, oddly enough, because we've been sort of circling each other for close to 30 years now. We have similar stories. We both started our bands in high school and went and toured for the entire 90s um, and did a lot of stuff. So you started, you guys started Right Collusion when you were still in high school, right? Yes. Yeah. We officially started the band in 93, where we were doing uh, like the first batch of songs. And then we recorded uh, a tape demo at a studio that we kind of had was like the first kind of pre-batch of songs before it kind of turned into the next stuff that we recorded for the first seven inch, which we recorded in 94. But the band, the first... Rye Show 2 was actually, I believe, in 93, before we were, like, fully serious. We played uh, a show at ABC No Rio. Okay, To, right. to no one. The guys, uh, the sound guys, I believe it was Neil, the famous ABC No Rio sound guy, and his right. dog. His dog. Those were the only people that were there. That's fun, though. But that was kind of <laughs> like, yeah. And then we kind of became more, um, as as we started playing together and learning how to play and just kind of started to like take it more seriously. And then we recorded this tape demo, which was, I guess, called the dancing man, which was the first thing that we really toured on. Like we did a tour the summer of 94 was the first tour that Rye coalition did. And we just had that tape demo. We didn't have a seven inch out yet. We might've actually recorded on that tour for that first seven inch maybe right because like, i believe it was like i forget what the guy's name was but he had a, a basement studio in baltimore around there or okay. in maryland and we might have recorded it on that tour and uh yeah so then so it's here always, we are it's always good to record on tour because you're tired. <laughs> yeah. well but you know you know I you're guess. playing and stuff yeah and as far as like playing the show at abc no Rio to no one it's like it still counts you know i mean yeah. i I played CBGB seven times and, sure. you know, like three of those times were to the other bands, but at yeah. least you played there and it counts. You know? Yeah, def- uh, and, definitely. I mean, and- that, that was a uh, ABC Tino Rio was the first, like when I, where I was introduced to like hardcore shows and like that whole, sure. Whatever era you want to call that, like the kind of tail end of the band. Um, Dave Lito, the bass player of Rye Coalition was in Merrill. Okay. Who were, and they're from Jersey City. His older brother, who's a couple of years older than him, but they were playing in that scene with like Born Against, Rorschach, 1.6 Band, right. um, Bug Out Society, Hwazi Pungo, all those bands. And then Ass Suck, all those bands would come through ABC right. Maria. And I was kind of like young and got in around that time, but missed like a lot of those, you know, like iconic epic shows from that scene. But that was like kind of, Rye Coalition kind of started around 93 when that was kind of uh, like over, like Rorschach had already broken up or right. against was already, you know, like kind of done around 93, I think. Um, and yeah, and then uh, do you know John Hiltz? That name he, is familiar. I'm sure he I was do. a I'm... drummer of Born Against and he um, he was in that band Grey House, also okay. another kind of like post hardcore band, but he had shows in his basement at his house in Westfield, New Jersey, which was kind of like an outpost of that. But like all of those early mid nineties indie bands would tour and like basically play his basement. Like I saw Godhead Silo in his basement, which was like, right. Yeah. I was probably 16 or 17, but like seeing a band like that come to the New Jersey basement was like, this is amazing. Right. <laughs> That so a lot of bands, a lot of bands played there, like Hoover played there, uh, Promise Ring, it's Unwound so... played there, you know, like, just like he had, like, I mean, there should be some kind of archive or document of the shows that happened at John Hilt's basement, you know? Right. That's so formidable, especially to a young musician that is trying to do this, to see it on that level and to realize you can do it. You know, oh, yeah, exactly. that was so, so important about the punk rock movement, movement, the hardcore movement in general is to just be able to see it done 
with, you know, a regular PA and no mics and, you know, whatever, just yeah. maybe a vocal mic and go, oh, shit, I can do this. Right. All we got to do yeah. is work up some songs and, and, and we can go yeah. and do this. And then, you know, we're on our way uh, to get it broken down. And I think that was what punk rock and hardcore was a response to in the first place is like, it didn't need to be at Madison Square Garden with this huge PA and lighting system and all that shit. It really was just three or four guys or five guys yeah. playing playing music. And that's what that's what this whole movement was a response to. And so that's uh, I think we all had those moments where you all had to get that quote unquote gateway drug. You know what I mean? Where it's right. like, oh, shit, you know, this is something that 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 I can actually do. It's not it's not in the ether. It's not this. Super no, human I can thing. I can relate to that exactly. Well put exactly what you said. I think that would be the impetus for me or like Rye Coalition um, realizing because there were so many bands. We were a bit younger than most of those bands, like but then seeing other bands are getting added to these kinds of shows when we first started playing and seeing like people around your age not this far reaching kind of thing where you know like i grew up loving metal and that kind of stuff but that was sure. never a thing as a kid where i was like there's no way i can like be in e like a band like exodus you know right like, right it well seems so so far away but then like getting into that kind of scene like the the hardcore shows like that or whatever it was because i don't really think rye was really a hardcore band we were always just kind of like on the outside of that but because dave was in merrill and like Charles, who was the singer for Rorschach, did that label, Gurren Blanston, who put out like so many of the post-hardcore stuff, like yeah. of the New Jersey, New York scene or whatever. And uh, having that kind of built-in support system from him already being in Rorschach and Dave already being in Merrill and the way like we were still using like book your own fucking life for like those first <laughs> dry tours and like um, that whole thing of seeing like other young people doing a similar kind of music where a lot of like the music also was very cookie cutter kind of sounding the same, but then every once in a while there would kind of be a bit of like an eclectic mix or this weird band that would be on this bill that wasn't exactly doing the straight like drop right. mosh pit kind of hardcore stuff, you know? Right. But I remember like to the point that you were making the, uh, the band that really, when I, from getting into Merrill, and Rorschach and like seeing and listening to those kinds of bands being like, wow, what is this kind of music? It's this crazy, weird, dissonant, not metal, but like the chords are these very odd jazz kind of, but like off disgusting, but also beautiful sounding stuff. And like the time signatures and the stuff were also weird. And like, they were doing like super fast stuff, but actually, I don't know if you know this band, but the band that where I was like, wow, this is something because they were our age a band called native nod they were also from new jersey where um i never heard of them i, I think i might have heard of but never yeah they of. were also young they were around maybe like a year older than everybody in rye but they're also on Gurren blanston they were done by like 1993 they played their right. last show in 94 but the kind of music that they were doing was this because like Rye started getting into and like worshiping like the touch and go kind of like post oh, yeah. hardcore Chicago bands, but like the way, especially the guitar player of Native Nod, this guy whose name is Justin Simon, who I was actually um, became really good friends with. He's still a friend. We don't really see each other that often, but like he was so young, but the way that he approached guitar and like what he was doing, it was like this thing where I was like, how is this person my age? Right. Because he's like playing like so old, but also like technical, but he was also into like tone. Right. Whereas like, I didn't even know what any of that stuff was when I was 16 or 17. It was just like plug into a shitty Yamaha and turn it up. And it just right. looked like a disgusting sandblaster with that strat that I had, you know, it would be right. such a, and like, you know, like, you're young, so you're just kind of bashing away. But I remember that that native nod band. I mean, I worshipped everything they ever did. The bass player's name is Dave Lerner. Um, and then the singer was Chris Leo and the drummer was Danny Leo. And their brother's Ted Leo, who's you know, Ted Leo on the pharmacist. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Ted was in Chisel and like Chisel was also on Gurren Blanc. And so it was this yeah. whole like community of that. But I just remember like from hearing those seven inches, those early native nod seven inches with like the way the guitar tone was and the parts were this like almost, um, yeah, I just, I don't even know how to describe what that feeling was like, but it, it gave me that feeling like you're saying where I was like, wow, I can do something creative that doesn't have to 
I, this is like an attainable thing to like do right. this feeling and then exploring guitar from there. Like when I, I became um, in Rye Coalition and learning how to play with each other in Rye Coalition and seeing all these other bands and then just worshiping all the bands like that were coming through. Cause growing up in around Jersey city, Maxwell's in Hoboken around yeah. that time, like all of those bands, even like they would, come and play Maxwell so you could see sure. like amazing bands there. Speaking of legendary <laughs> of legendary venue, I can't tell, I count a hey, count how many times I played Maxwell's in Hoboken. And, yeah. and also I can't count how many times I played Maxwell's to an empty <laughs> empty sure, room. Sure, yeah. But of still it's it's a legendary place. There's you like, know, um, it, it's funny you you bring up uh Touch and Go Records and I definitely hear Touch and Go and and Dwayne Dennison the wonderful amazing Dwayne Dennison and you're God. playing and you yeah. I mean, Jesus, you know, not even, I, not even a God, just God. Yeah. Jesus. You can't, I mean, you can't, oh God. it's amazing. He's one, of guitar those, player. he's one of those guys that it's almost like somebody gave him a guitar and he didn't hear any other guitar playing and he just yeah. played what he heard in his head and with yeah. no, no reference to anything else. And, and I, I mean, think I, Jesus lizard has a band as well, you know, everyone in that band, you know? I mean, Rye coalition just worshiped everything they ever did. And, you know, we would kind of get like, pigeonholed as just a jesus lizard ripoff we were so young also doing it but i mean it's not even sure. at this point i mean it wouldn't we were uh 100 just trying to do exactly that but we were well, also it, like learning how to play music while worship like right like listening to that like when it was out and being like wow you got to do a part like you know this and like the way like Den dwayne dennison um approaches guitar is so like he sounds like many people playing but if you actually see what he's doing he's like almost like a minimal approach absolutely and like and his tone is so dialed into his attack and like his skill mm -hmm. and it's just like the way that i mean it, to me that that guy was one of the people that i idolized still today and we, you know we, especially with the rye stuff from my approach of like what i was trying to do would just be like just yeah. try to like copy Dwayne Dennis, emulate yeah. yeah well and you know that's another guy i talk about it a lot you know distortion with with heavy music and with loud music and with right. rock music distortion's your friend you know it's gonna right. it's gonna it's gonna help you along it's gonna push your notes it's gonna glue in sure. and, you know it's gonna cover up some mistakes Dwayne dennison plays with barely any distortion it's just loud no, and right. crystal clean and a lot yeah. of mid-range a lot of treble yeah and I feel like I don't really know much about like the technical side of a lot of people that I, you know, like I just kind of like hear stuff, know what I like, but I, is he like a high, maybe he's like a custom guy now, but was he just using Travis Beans into like a high watt? Like for using, those, from what I understand, I never really saw pedal. Records. I saw them a lot back then and I never yeah. saw much pedals, if any. And it was, yeah, yeah. you're right. It's like a, it was like a high watt half stack. I want to say at some point, maybe he had a combo, maybe a matchless, yeah. uh, but he was he was original oh, Travis yeah, yeah he was original Travis Bean stuff and then he had Hamer which is really odd oh wow yeah that's weird around that time when they had that uh, metal, metal Kimball the guy uh, Jim uh, Kimball Jim Kimball playing drums yeah. he had a high like a Hamer deal where he had Hamer Strat oh wow and then during the advent of the oh, electrical yeah. gu electrical guitar company that we were talking about right. Um, they he, have a of course, Dwayne Dennison model. They, he has oh, the Dwayne sure, Dennison yeah. model, which is like semi hollow Cheshire or something like that. But, um, but speaking of that, and back to you, you we were talking about this off mic. You have uh, a custom-made aluminum Telecaster or guitar yes. that you say is your only guitar that you play. And Pretty give much. Me, In give the, me the rise history. Stuff. Yeah. Give me the history of that. Well, I mean, I could talk, talk about the Jesus Lizard kind of stuff or like buzz all day. But basically, like, in the mid mid to like 97 there was this music store in jersey called outlaw music which was just like a vintage store so you could roll up there and they would just be flush with like you know 1970 marshall super leads heads that you could get for like 400 dollars. right which during that time when you're a child that's an astronomical sum to be like i can't afford a 400 hundred dollar 1970 right. marshall super lead or like you know the vintage guitars too back then because there's so much stuff now you have so many options with the way you can acquire stuff like that but it, they would just have stuff and it would seem so unattainable because it's like i can't spend 
five hundred dollars on a sixty nine Jazz Master, but that guitar <laughs> is probably like a ten thousand guitar, ten thousand yeah. dollar guitar now. Yeah. So like, if you would see something like a Travis Beam come through there in Jersey, it would be very rare or few and far between to like come and see a Travis Bean in a guitar store. But like the other members of Rye, like Dave and Justin, the bass player, like they knew like the Travis Bean, like that's the Jesus Lizard guitar. Like that's, you know, like that insane guitar with the metal piece in the neck, like that's how they get that. That's how, yeah. Albini, that's how Albini gets that sound like that, you know, but I never was able to really get like gear really. Cause I would just, you know, like, I would either have to buy it with my own cash or like, you know, work hard to save for it. And then it was just like, you know, I was never like a gearhead early on, you know, like I just yeah. had what worked and Rye was always doing the chaotic live thing where it was just like, go out there and just go as crazy as possible. Make sure you're going crazier than any other band on the bill so that you stand just out and people remember out. you and yeah. also be able to play like that. That's Rye. why I like, I thought Rye was different than a lot of those bands because we would be on a lot of those hardcore bills, you would have a band that would click in like one, two, three, four, and immediately would be all on the floor. And it would just sound like a maelstrom of noise. Whereas Ryan <laughs> would go nuts and we would like actually try to play the songs well, you know? Sure. <laughs> like, but that first European tour was in 97. Rye had their first record out. And, you know, during that time, like I still can't even fathom what that was like we were still young. Like I was, I would think I was 20 other members of the band were 21. And, uh, you have someone who organized the tour via old school mail correspondence or like, right. pay, pay phones. So like someone meets you at the airport and then like everything's kind of taken care of through a punk rock system of like borrowing the gear in a van. Like, cause you know, it's 1997 and you're kind of like playing squats or like community centers or, whatever it is, like a school stage in like Slovenia, like, yeah. And then we had a, a, a run of a few shows, which I remember the band was called Kurt. I forget where they were from in Germany. And then the other band was called Guinea pig and it was Rye. And the dude with them was this old school German punk who was just a fucking awesome dude. Just like get ripped, like smoke hash cigarettes and just like drink oh, yeah. the fucking beers and like totally be fine. Right. Whereas, you know, like you would be, um just so psyched to meet like we hit it off with them because rye had kind of a rough tour over there where you know like maybe we rubbed some people the wrong way or just being like I idiot kids that didn't really know like what was going on and like you're so young at that time too and just like you know like so we we hit it off with those two bands and then this guy who was with them he was like a maybe a handful of years older he was their roadie or just with them, their friend. And the member, the guitar player of that band, Guinea Pig, had this guitar that pretty much looked like like a Fender, like a maybe like a Gibson Firebird kind of look. But then I would yeah. like see it and I was like, what the fuck is that? It looks like the guy's playing like a fucking sewer plate. It was like rusted out metal. And then, you know, when we became friends, I, I, I was like, hey, can I, you know, can I feel that? And it was like, you know, probably weighed like 20, 30 pounds. It was so yeah. heavy. I was like, what is that? He's like, Tommy, this guy, Tommy Kappas. I think it's K-A-P-P-E-S, Tommy Kappas. His family trade was being a blacksmith. So he learned his family trade as being a blacksmith, but he was also just a punk and a musician himself. So he was cutting these guitars by hand. The body would be a hand cut aluminum body. And then would take like you know a firebird neck or a telecaster neck or that and basically screw it into this hand cut metal body that um you know it would have kind of a unique thing and i was like wow that's as close to i don't think i knew what valinos were yet at right, that time because right, right, Valino right, right. has the aluminum neck and the aluminum body all aluminum, that yeah. That was as close to a to a Travis Bean as I was like, I will never have this chance again. So he was like, I will give, he let me play one like towards one of the last shows. He had like a Telecaster version with them. And he was like, yeah, go ahead, give it a try. And I played it. I was like, holy shit, this is it. This is the the thing, you know, like this is as close to like sounding like Dwayne Dennison as, I'll, as my idiot 20 year old approach will ever get. 
And he was like, you can have it if you give me that strat. And I was like, fucking take it, dude. And he's really? Like, yeah. And I, I had that 92 Lake Placid Blue American strat, which if I still had, that was an awesome guitar. But like, you know, at the time being a kid, like, you know, you don't know, like that's going to be like a rare guitar. Sure. Yeah, but years. still, but I mean, still, you know, I would think it was, really was like, it was like my first real guitar. Like I borrowed a lot of guitars from other people too, you know, and yeah. like, I was always that kind of person, like always borrowing shit. And then uh, I was like, yes take it thank you right. so much and then i used it on like every rye recording since basically and like every rye show ever like after that like i played that guitar and i still have it like i still use it um That's rye, awesome. rye played a couple months ago and i still use that guitar and it's like indestructible i've like broken it in two pieces i've like it's still going i've changed out the pickups a couple times he had like a it was like a Telecaster cut body with like kind of a solid block through and it's kind of like a little bit hollow around the wings. And then sure. it was like a Telecaster neck with like a branded thing in the headstock that says flex with two X's. And then it's like on the back T2 model, which I don't know if it's like a Terminator reference. Or right, just because, right. Like his name's Tommy, but um, I lost touch with him for a while and he kind of... Um, reached back out and then a few years ago like you know five years turns into seven years you know how it goes oh sure like, it was like oh you know i can make you another one and send it to you i was like what a, a, sure man i'll pay you whatever you want like it's yeah. such a such a sentimental attachment to that guitar because it's just like it's one of those things like it's just like a, a piece of my entire identity and well, life and it falls it yeah. falls into that pedigree of another thing that i love and i'm fascinated with and i've talked about it on here before where punk rock bands and punk rock guitar players would align themselves with a sort of um, uh, a, a guitar. That's his guitar. Yeah. And when, you know, let's say Johnny Ramone with the most right to um, uh, Greg Ginn with the Dan Armstrong, right. Dan yeah. Armstrong. Um, you know, uh, Dwayne Dennison with the Travis Bean right. and these, you know, it's like these forgotten guitars and these forgotten players yeah. that are doing this great thing. And it's like, no, that's my guitar. And that's just the yeah. thing that they did forever. Even Tom Morello, to a certain extent, he has that performance, like shredder, right. go fast yep. guitar that I call it. And that was like, that's my guitar. And he'll even tell you yeah. that guitar is a piece of shit, but that's his guitar. Right. And, and I just love that. I've always loved that. You know, I, I, even though I am a Gibson guy through and through and, you know, it, it is a bit boring. It's like, it's been done before. And I've always wanted yeah. that, like, you know, that, that guitar and you have that and i think that's that's really Thanks. really interesting yeah 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 i, I feel right. that actually i never thought about it until you just mentioned that but i mean after i brought that guitar back like friends in the band it maybe became kind of a joke and it's like stupid hearing it now because it's just that thing but like my friends would they would call me johnny crone <laughs> because <laughs> you should like, have anybody fun. who knows me it's like oh johnny chrome or chrome 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 or it's like yeah, oh, you should, shit. You should, it became like a, this part of my identity where it's like i think I'm it's a never, badge it's a badge yeah, of honor my friend i, I see honor. it as like a badge of honor and like yeah. that that guitar has been through every single amazing up and down of you know like being in uh rye coalition and like played well, every gig with it you know and it's like i was never the Rye was never the kind of band either that had techs or like many guitars. I would be lucky right. if I had a backup guitar. Like I would play shows with only that guitar and maybe a pack of strings in, in case I broke a string, you know? <laughs> like, well, that's, that's important too. And, that's let's back, and let's back up a bit because, you know, it's, it's, it was important for guys like us in the nineties that were touring with just ourselves right. to have a reliable piece of gear to have a reliable yeah. guitar or reliable amp wasn't going to fuck up with yeah. you know you, you you brushed upon it a bit ago but like people that are listening now that might be in bands that might tour nowadays i hate to be that old fogey and go like you know back in my day or back in our day right but we were touring and booking ourselves with book your own fucking life the book right we were opening a maps go you know the big binder I and with yeah. you know and trying to getting fucking lost and going five yeah. hours in the wrong direction and all oh, that. Yeah. So everything else is <laughs> anarchy and yeah. you got four or five you know 20 year olds in yeah. a goddamn van and it's it's i wouldn't change it for the world and i'm so no. glad cell phones didn't exist i'm so glad we got lost in the desert i'm so yeah. glad because those are my favorite memories of all time but you wanted to worry about the shit you had in your gear fucking up. You wanted that to be the least of your worries. Well, and I so think you, you could probably relate to this. Like 
if you had an amp and the tube broke, you couldn't really just go to a music store and pay for it to get fixed. You had to find the punk guy that knew how to fix tubes exactly. that could do it in 15 you know, minutes or like an hour before yeah. you had the 12 hour drive to get to fucking North Dakota, wherever the next terrible show was. Yeah. But it was like, and you had to kind of find someone. How did you find, like, how would that even happen? Dude, like, I can't tell you how many times we'll if, I, if, if I had a tube go out, I would take the, if it was like, so I had a hundred watt Marshall JCM 900 and one tube would pop. So I take the other one out and make it a 50 watt just to have, you know. Yeah. Like you would have to know how to do that. But yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, I didn't well, mean to cut you off. But no, you're fine. You're fine. So, yeah. so we'll we'll go back even further. So, originally, when did you start playing guitar? How old were you when you started? I guess I was 12. Actually, I kind of, uh, I think for my 12th birthday, my mom got me a guitar because uh, I fucking worshipped Appetite for Destruction. Basically, I mean that was like the... you answered two questions there because I was going <laughs> to yeah, ask you. Just... Who started you back then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I loved, uh, I mean, I grew up in a house where like my mom was always playing music. My mom and, uh, you know, like she was a child of the 70s, basically. And sure. I'm lucky in that she's very close to my age. Like she had me when she was very young. But growing up, there was always, I mean, also being a child of MTV, like when MTV was like right. early to mid 80s and just I had an older cousin, but just like having that on and always being allowed to watch MTV, like seeing the most amazing shit when you're a kid. And then like, you know, I, uh, I feel like the first like records maybe that I coveted or that like were my own records that I was like allowed to get. I remember were like a bit earlier, I was like very young, but quiet riot mental health. Like I had that cassette and then license to ill the yeah. Beastie boys cassette and uh, raising hell run DMC. Like those were the first three tapes that I actually was like, these are mine. And I listened to it. And like those two, um, License the Ill and Raising Hell, very like guitar based kind of stuff. You know, like a lot of those samples are like a lot, a lot of just, I feel like Kerry King is like plays on both of those records. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Rick, Rick Rubin would be like, get Kerry in here. He'll do the, you know, like that kind of thing. And then from then, just always like, you know, but then I don't know what it was, 87 or whenever Appetite for Destruction came out. I was still pretty young, you know, and yeah. then uh, I was just like religious, like would listen to it until the print on the cassette was like completely off. You know what I right. mean? Like when you right. would do that and there's nothing left on the cassette and it's just that gray blank cassette, but it's, uh -huh. it should have like the whole track listing on both sides. And then um, I was allowed to get a guitar my 12th birthday. And then I kind of like took a lesson or two maybe, you know, but barely um and then i kind of played with a couple kids like in my school that were also either had the older brother who was into like heavy heavier stuff you know like because then from there I started to getting into the heavier stuff like you know the thrash and the, and the metal and like it was almost like worshiping appetite for destruction as a kid but then as you get you know being from where i was from the older kids and then there's metal kids and then it's yeah. like Nah, that's that's your opposer. Like Appetite for Destruction is your opposer <laughs> with that shit. Like you don't know fucking Metal Church or like you know Nuclear Assault or like all the thrash shit. Then from the town where I was, and it's either like an older brother or the older metal kids or something. Right. And it would just kind of be like would start getting into the more heavier stuff, but then from there, um, kill them all. Ride the Lightning, oh, yeah. the Puppets, and then Justice for All. That was really what made me get serious where I was like, I think I had to take a guitar lesson as a condition of getting the guitar, like right. from my mom. And you want to learn Metallica riffs? Yeah, and I just showed up and the guy was like this, you know, he was probably in his 20s, but he was just like a fucking blues dude, you know, and he was like an amazing guitar player thinking back on it for the time, but I would just show up and be like, just show me how to play the fucking breakdown melodic yeah. solo and master of puppets, dude. I don't, I don't want to learn the why yeah. and how, I don't learn the, oh, I just man. let I me be able to <laughs> I don't give a fuck fucking... about Born Under a Bad Sign or like James Blood Ulmer, dude, I'm fucking 13, I just want to oh. play like <laughs> James, <laughs> James Blood Ulmer. <laughs> Yeah, dude. Yeah. So then it was that, and then like really worshiping like 
those records, like, again, I remember getting Ride the Lightning and Master of Puppets in the double plastic cassette thing. Like, they both came together at Kmart, you know? Yep. And, and I, I was allowed to get those. And I was like, holy shit, like, this is the shit. Like, and then that's yes, what it was. made me get serious because uh, from there, then I was like, oh, Guitar World, they do, do these things where it's like, I mean, you see the songs and be like, shitty, shitty, shitty song. And then every once in a while, it'll be like, oh, fuck, the tab two you know, whatever, like they have the tablature. Cause I never learned to read music. I had two different guitar teachers, but I only did like a handful of lessons. And I remember the second guitar teacher I had, I wish I could remember what his name was or find where he is now, because that guy was amazing. Like he taught me something that stayed with me still where he was like teaching me like the modes and that kind of stuff, which I didn't, again, didn't give a shit about cause I just wanted to learn how to play like Metallica, Metallica songs. Yeah, but uh, he taught me this thing. He was just like rhythm, rhythmic awareness, and internal hearing are the most important things that you'll ever learn. So really, just like don't even worry about notes. Just like do the chick, 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 and like you know keep what time I... with your foot, and then whatever. Like if you want to play mosh within that, like you know you do the thing, like you know zero 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 one zero. Like because I can right. never, I can never read music and trying to learn stuff early on was just from like trying to read tablature, which in itself is a cool brain exercise, I guess, sure. because you're looking at, but still like today, if I look at that shit, like I can't even really, it's just like, you know, looking at it. It's, that's how I would try to learn someone else's song, I guess today. Sure. Like, I would try to do the tab and I, I regret not putting the time in and really learning the theory and like how to read music, but you know, well, from as like, long as it gets you started, I'm sorry to interrupt. Got me started. Yeah, as long yeah. as it gets you there to get to where you, you know, you started your own band and toured the world. Yeah. And you know, you you got there and you found your own way. You know, it's just like a leg up. It's sort of like a, you know, a piggyback to 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 giving you your your own little path. Yeah. And then you it figure out you your a, own your own way around it. I mean, I always felt more comfortable with um, trying to create my own patterns within. You know, like I can never fully learn like one of Kirk Hammett's solos, like when I was a kid or like I could never right. fully learn like the whole of like battery or disposable heroes, like all the way through from the tab. Because it was like, this shit is so fucking hard. These guys are insane. And I'm only like 14. Like, <laughs> so I would kind of like take what I would learn and then like, and I never learned like what anything was like minor chord, right. major chord, this, there was the fucking Iron Man chord, the power chord or whatever it is, like whatever you call that. Is that a fifth or like, yeah, it's, it's a fifth. I kind of like would feel my way around and like figure stuff out on my own. Yeah. That was like close to that. I also loved like, um, like the Hendrix stuff too. Cause like, sure. kind of like as you, as you progress or get a little bit more mature as a teenager, then it's almost like, you know, not so stringent like oh i can only listen to like speed metal like creator halloween and all that it's like if but it's like you know you're so close-minded when you're young but i, was sure. like, I still knew that i loved like like hendrix and then when they would publish like a hendrix song in guitar world you know it would be like little wing and then it would show you the solo of little wing. yeah it would be like such a stock thing but it's like learning that solo with the tab almost like taught me how to do that blues box kind of thing. Of course. And then like taking what, I mean, for me, like, I don't know really what chords are. There's like the power chord, which I would call the power chord, Iron Man chord, the octave chord, which is, I call the Fugazi chord. <laughs> I love that. And there's the, the Hendrix chord, which is the purple haze chord. What is that weird tripod thing where it's like, you know, you do it, it's like three notes and you can right. add the pinky to make it sound like that, like right. fifth kind of funky thing, but that's the fucking Hendrix chord. So you right. only need, you need the fucking Fugazi chord, the power <laughs> chord and the fucking Hendrix chord. And I that's pretty it. much it, you know? Well, and then that's, like, that's what's genius about what we do though, because you're talking about a bar chord. And right. if you know a bar chord, it is the key to the kingdom because it doesn't matter who you are. If you play rock and roll music, um, of course, if you know one bar chord, you can play every Ramon song. You can you pretty right. much play every ACDC song. Yeah. You can play every. Yeah. And I mean, you don't have to know what it's called. I love that you have your 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 shorthand and that you you know. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of bands do have that. You know, let's do the sludge chord. Let's do the 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 iron the Iron Man chord. Let's well, do. The, I think you know. I think that I was lucky in that somehow this weirdo 
crazy far out dude who was teaching me about lunch music and like telling me to, uh, the second guitar teacher that I had was telling me to like, you know, listen to fucking Stravinsky writes a spring and like all this kind of weird far out, like, Deep right. jazz shit. And I was like, I'm fucking 13. Like, what am I gonna do? Right. It's so but lovely. teaching me that internal hearing rhythmic awareness thing, as long as you know that box, whatever you want to call it, the blues box, or is that yep. the pentatonic? Like, I don't really pentatonic. know exactly what that is. And pentatonic. you can do that rhythmic awareness, kind of just chop along and then hit a note here, hit a note there mm-hmm. in time. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is from going from there and then forming a band without even knowing how to play and then learning how to play from other people in the band all figuring it out together by like having my musical vocabulary grow from learning all the stuff to these other kids that were way deeper into like knowing the cool post-hardcore indie bands and hearing all this new kind of shit that was so mind-blowing to apply to like you know the feeling of still today like just being home and like figuring out that progression or something that works together that like comfort of being in that safe space when it like really works you right. feel that feeling inside like that was the same feeling when i was 14 or 15 that i still have now where i'm like man this is this is and, like the safe space this is the and best see, John, feeling I, in the world i love that that's then, what like, has, that's what has kept me coming back to this my yeah. entire life and then, because like, you still think you still learn every day. You're still stuck, yeah. you know. But yeah. like, I feel like I still use the same kind of approach of uh, if it's good enough, you don't need to fucking record it to the voice memo graveyard. You play it over and over again, and then you'll remember it the next time you sit down. You know, that's like a great pattern. way to put that. If you link stuff together, if it's two parts and you're trying to come up with a riff and a change, if you don't remember it tomorrow when you sit down to play, it's, it wasn't fucking. Just yeah. forget about it. That's basically. a great. That's a great point. And 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 voice memo graveyard. I love that because yeah. as as a writer, we all have those. And I I almost I almost like I'm scared of it sometimes because yeah. it's so daunting. There's so much of it. And then you go back in something and it was good. And for some reason, yeah. you're right. It didn't. It didn't translate. And you did forget. And you're like, oh fuck, I have this thing. Yeah. You know. Um, but as creative people, I, I I love that there is a tool like voice memo. Of course, yeah. I mean, there's but, so much like humor and crazy. Like I, you know, like the whole thing with Ryan, always have such a dark like. Just take the sense of humor as far as possible. You know, like you see, like you follow like the hard times or like those kinds of sites oh, yeah, where you yeah, just yeah. do like this crazy shit where it's basically like you know, guitar player thinks that he should record this riff and then it's basically you know like why <laughs> well, i was saying like you can come up with an app that's called the voice member graveyard where you record it to voice memo and it just automatically deletes it for it you. automatically so goes. No it goes nowhere that's you what's going to put me on the map not yeah. right coalition <laughs> speak going back to right coalition if i'm wrong the trajectory of right coalition through the years so like yeah you started off as you know there was a jesus lizard thing happening there was like uh dare i say oh, maybe yeah. like a, a john reese maybe was there a drive like of Jay course Drew? oh yeah, yeah. I, was, I mean he's like the other god where it was basically like absolutely. you know absolutely. i mean hearing all the hardcore bands and then stuff but then like hearing like you know bullhead and like hearing boris like what the fuck is this like yeah I mean, hearing the way here? Buzz, like all those early melvin's records where it's like they're still like you know that was still in that scene, but still it was, that was like, holy shit, like this, you know? And then like, well, see, that was what was impressive for me because you guys were, an, what, what you thought was an East coast band. Cause I'm from Texas right. and you didn't sound like those bands. You're right. You did go for yeah. like, we, you didn't want to be a cookie cutter band. So like, here's no. this band that's doing this touch and go like, yeah. like, like Swami records, you know, kind of yeah. thing. And, I mean, and, they're from New Jersey, you know. Rye worshipped Drive Like Jehu. Those first two Drive oh, Like yeah. Jehu records are fucking masterpiece records. But I remember also just like John Reese's approach, the way he played guitar, but also his whole thing, like the way that he, you know, like his whole stage presence, like everything was yeah. just a thing where I was like, that is like, I want to be that, you know. Yep. Like, and he was so fucking cool and like his riffs were cool and it was just like, he was like badass, like totally interesting and unique as well and like also the drive like jay who sh- shit was like the interplay between two guitars was like a right. lot more crazy or mathy than the rocket from the crypt stuff which rye really gravitated to those 
drive like Jehu records because like what we, the stuff that we were doing during that time with those Fugazi chords, those like high octave kind of like what yep. would get called, I guess. I don't even know because there's so many genres now. Like I guess you would call it emo core. It's right, right, so right. stupid to say, but <laughs> I, re- I saw drive like Jehu at Maxwell's. I think I was still in high school. It was like on the Yank Crime tour and it was just like, holy fucking shit. I can't believe like I'm like, so right. another thing too, like where I was going back, the guy that I was telling you about in Native Nod, he is the one too. I would try to emulate a lot of his shit, but he was the one that showed me this thing that was pretty much a John Reese thing where it was like, there's this thing called the AB box and you could play two fucking amps at once. Oh yeah. And once I heard that, I was like, holy shit. Like, what am I doing? Like, why do I only have one amp? And then I oh, saw yeah. John Reese with the dueling fucking, you know, he would have the, the backwards, the grill, the back grill on the front, so he could do that crazy fucking bird mm-hmm. feedback thing that he does with the uh-huh. two the two marshals next to each other. And you know, like any shithead like me shows up at the uh the the small venue in fucking Cincinnati, the sound guy's like, Yeah, you're gonna want to turn that down to like Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, why fucking John Reese comes here, I'm sure you don't tell him to turn it down, you know, but it's like that's the the uh the naive like mm-hmm. idiot, you know, just like but um totally worshipped like that whole um yeah approach and, it, that and, it, took, and, like... and and that's what i thought was impressive about you guys but starting with like your say jersey girls record did you guys get in there's a there's like an acdc thing happening on that am i wrong there no i mean well after the like we kind of went through two different lineup changes the rye band like the lipstick game record is pretty much a different lineup and then once we came back to like the original five piece lineup we were gravitating more towards like i mean that era too like 99 to 2002 we also like we did a lot of shows with um these are also people in terms of guitar people that i fucking worship and admire like trans and phil manley from trans and incredible guitar player and like we started playing shows with them and seeing like holy shit like they're doing because it was like, when you're doing those shows when we're younger, it's almost like you can't fucking like Zeppelin or Sabbath. Like you're not right. fucking punk. You're not vegan if you listen to fucking Deep Purple. You know. Like, <laughs> you know what I that mean? Should, like, that should be on a shirt. <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Because you, I know what you mean. So it was this weird thing of like we would kind of be pigeonholed as dicks, or like, but then it was almost like there was all these rules as well, and. I, I always feel like from an early stage, like Rye always fucking hated that. And we would almost right. kind of like do it on purpose to just be like, fuck, fuck. Yeah. what the fuck? You know, like, yeah, you don't, you, I mean, all the, the rules. And also with the sound too, like there was yeah. a lot of the bands would kind of sound the same, but like, you know, like we loved all that um, gravity record shit, like that band heroin that was on gravity, like all that San Diego shit around that time. was. I like, loved heroin. Amazing. I had to- my band Hackfish opened Amazing for we, we yeah. opened for heroin in like ninety two and I had their seven yeah. inch. I remember it was that white was vinyl. Awesome. Yeah, it was yeah. great. And I remember and the dude the- had one of those the SG, it was just a walnut like or maybe yeah. it was the, the the Paul, there was like the Paul and the SG. Yeah. And he had maybe both of those. But yeah, my singer in Rise Against uh, Tim McElrath and I talk about yeah. heroin all the time. That's yeah, funny. I mean like and then um you know, like those bands too from San Diego, like, you know, I guess Rock from the Crypt would be considered that kind of scene as well. But like, they would take a lot of flack for being like, you know, they're just all style and no fucking substance. Or like wow. Antioch Arrow, who was like some members of Heroin, we played like early shows with them and they would just come out like the guy would be dressed like fucking Mick Jagger in like a beautiful fur coat, just like looking That's like awesome. he stepped up fucking stage with the velvet underground they would come out and just do this sick like fucking noise shit and people would just not know what to do right you know? i love they, that like, what is this why are they on this fucking straight edge show with uh all these tooth and nail like christian bands right. <laughs> <laughs> I looks love- like he just fucking stepped off stage with the velvet underground I and like that. uh we worship that kind of stuff like because they were different you know they were doing yeah. something different or like uh that's, I mean, that's... Unwound as well, like still one of the greatest guitar players, Justin Trosper, like all of those Unwound records, like those yeah. songs are still in that vein, but then like they st- they still withstand the test of time because they were just doing this like interesting songwriting and like his approach to guitar is totally unique. His sound is totally unique and they just sound fucking awesome, like still. 
So it was like partly like that math rock thing. And then like worshiping those kinds of bands and like all the touch and go bands. Like I loved like Bastro, you know, like I loved fucking Slint, like all the Louisville yeah. bands too. Like they were just like doing mind blowing shit. And then it was like around that time, like we started playing a lot of shows with Trans Am and then somehow we also befriended that band, the fucking champs who are I like, love that band too. I, I mean, love that. Tim bands. Green is one yeah. of my favorite guitar players of all time. Like he, I mean, the nation of Ulysses as well, like Rye worshiped the nation of Ulysses and then like becoming friends with the fucking champs and like being like, I can't believe like Tim Green is like my yeah. fucking friend. You know? well, I, love, I also love that that drummer horrible. Sebastian from Trans Am is in Baroness now. Right, uh, exactly. And that's yeah, such a but, great, that's such but, a great uh, pairing. So, I'm, you like, know, I'm trying to answer your question though, because I'm like melting your face off. So getting back <laughs> around to like changing the sound to more like, for some reason, like during that era, like where I started throwing in like fucking, you know, Dazed and Confused or like communication breakdown or just doing zeppelin songs because like trans am loved fucking you know like they also were like not ashamed of just liking anything that sounded good to them whether it was fucking rush or like craft work or like right. you know the punk band dianoga from fucking like cleveland or like you know like and right. then uh so then it just became a thing where it was like you don't want to do the same shit over and over again and then like the shit that we were listening to and like really loving, like loving all the classic rock stuff. And then like, you know, like as a musician, you want to change and challenge yourself. And it just kind of like felt natural of a progression, you know, like when we were writing stuff that was kind of like more rock, but still with that dissonant sound in there. And right. then when Herb, the other guitar player came back to the band, he was always somebody that could just fucking easily, ever since I met him when he was a kid, he could do those fucking kind of solos, which I was always right. so jealous of. I still can't fucking play like that, but he could just do it so effortlessly. Like he could do like fucking since I've been loving you style shit as with his eyes closed, I'm not even trying. Like I could right. never play like that still. And I'll never be able to play like that. So we had a song that was basically like, you know, ripping off the since I've been loving you thing. Cause we were just fucking worshiping Zeppelin, like, you know, yeah. like all that kind of stuff. Deep purple. Yeah. As you do. DC. Yeah. And then it just felt right when he came back to like start adding his more his style would be like you know more soloing and shit but right. we still kind of didn't know what the fuck we were doing because like if you listen back to like that on top record of the jersey girl shit like we're playing like minor chords and major chords at the same time like we don't know what the fuck we're doing. <laughs> that's okay <laughs> that was kind of that scene like the fucking champs there's this awesome band from san francisco also called drunk horse i don't know if you know those dudes like fucking amazing awesome band like we were tour with them and the champs the other guitar player the original guitar player before phil started playing with the champs that guy josh smith was like incredible guitar player yeah. he was be like he had like this special guitar that was like a nine string guitar oh wow would have like double strings on the high you know right and, right right and, right but then it was like makes sense it's, because they would set up with just, they had no bass player and they would do like what they called the Champa Theater setup, which is essentially like both using two amps, but in stereo, like the other guy would have one. And then, you know what I mean? Like they would stop. Right, right, right. It just had this awesome, fills it up sound, you know? So, so it was just like those kind of bands too were so learning the musical vocabulary from them and like the shit that they were listening to was like, you know. So then it was just, that's how we kind of veered more towards the like the rock sound and then okay. i was just like okay how are you gonna stand out just go out there and go fucking crazy yeah. and then it was like oh okay acdc did this in fucking 1970 so it's like you're not reinvented the wheel but right throw in throw in a whole lot of rosie and we started covering that and we did a recording of that around the jersey girls when we recorded that shit at steve albini's the on top and the jersey girls stuff and then we just started putting that in our set and then that would always bring the unite you know any hater or like whenever you have that we, there's always that weird person in the shadows that's like you know and then they come out and they like love you know the whole lot of rosy cover or something you right know? it just kind of fit in with the stuff and then it just became a thing that worked live right so we, uh, we just kept doing it and then we kind of well, the stuff became like uh i guess more rock more like right. straight forward rock you know well and that culminates with it leads you toward dave Grohl producing one of your records how, how yeah. did that how did that come well, up? like basically 
we it was always a fucking goal of ours or a dream to record with steve albini because we fucking worship like all like the, the breeders record like sure. you know all the jesus records that he recorded all like the early shellac stuff i don't know if he actually recorded that but it's just like again like a hero to us also in terms of guitar playing one of the like the people as well like oh for sure his guitar playing is fucking amazing you know always try to like what an original that. yeah yeah total original um even the way he wears it with the weirdo putting the strap around like a yeah yeah yeah. It's so yeah fucking weird <laughs> guy's awesome so we actually were like trying for a long time to go and record with him and we act we were going to record with him a longer time ago i think it was like before the on top record but then he recorded that bush record so we like had the time schedule but then he kind of had to bump us to go record like razor blade suitcase or one of those like right. bush records that he did so then we like kept with it again this is all just like i mean we would organize all this shit ourselves like you find steve albini's phone number and fucking call him and schedule a recording session right. like, did that happen I, it probably still happens with him but it was like us you know right then it was like we have all these songs same kind of thing you write the new songs you get together you practice them you play them live and you like get them tight enough you know and we're like okay let's try to play a couple shows so we can get enough money to afford you know I think we spent ten thousand dollars to record the on top record, which in two thousand um we recorded it in two thousand one. So that was like an astronomical amount of money to us. So we raised like five thousand from playing shows, called them to schedule it, and then we borrowed the other half from someone, which we you know, we say was like a loan shark. Anyway, right. somebody was nice enough, a friend, right? <laughs> so we show up there with fucking literally like cash you know and it was um such an amazing learning experience to like amazing experience to be able to record with him and then you know it's just like the dream sound and everything and you would just be tight it wasn't like go in do a click or anything we would go in play fucking live and then you know ralph would sing over the live shit Rare, we wow. rarely That's did great. any overdubs there because he's the kind of person who'd be like you know i'm not gonna give of any kind of suggestions like whatever you know but if it's like yeah. something you ask me sure i'll do this or that but it was like set up play live so we recorded maybe like took like five days or something you know you would set up get some sounds and then try to record as many songs within the eight to ten hour work day that you could and we've just fucking did it and uh you know like his setup was amazing like that was kind of when he first maybe moved over to the new uh electrical recording space it was yeah. kind of almost freshly built again like what an amazing experience for someone to open up their whole thing and be like, here's every Travis Bean that I own. Use whatever yeah. you want. Here's three Valinos. And I was like, what the fuck are those? These metal guitars with like a beautiful ruby in the headstock. So I was like, holy shit, like we can use all this. Yep. And he's like, you can just show up naked and you don't need anything. It's just come yeah. here. So it was like kind of did like that where it was like learning that, oh, you can use like other gear to get like sounds, you know? I mean, we did that earlier on with the records but it was uh you know like close to our live sound we we're like using high watts and maybe or 120s and like marshall super leads getting a live thing it went so well and we still had a batch of songs left over so then we scheduled another recording thing to record that jersey girls ep and then we recorded uh a whole lot of rosie cover and uh a grand funk railroad song that oh, was great. became like a sub pop singles club which was like yeah, another yeah. dream it was like how do we even how are we getting a sub pop pop singles seven inch like right. what is this am i dreaming right. you know and uh we recorded that in the other studio studio b and then from there like we were really trying we were booking tours and just fucking touring we toured for like two years on those records just like i was literally the booking agent where I set up a company, you know, I was to make it seem like we had a booking agent, you know, it was me, you know, but I would be like faxing resumes and uh, not resumes. Like I would copy like a booking agent thing. So it looked like, Oh, you have a deal, you know, like you, were, you know, the $400, $200 guarantee, but it was right. just me, you know, and like people would sometimes be like, Oh, you're in the band or you're the manager. It's like, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So then we toured, and then we had a public, like we had a publicist, you know, we were like doing, working really hard 
people started kind of noticing the band more. We were getting like, we just fucking toured. We, we'd go on tour, come home, kept touring, which you know. And then somehow from meeting people or whatever it was, it was like the peak of um, the Queens of the Stone Age songs for the deaf thing. I was literally washing dishes in my grandparents' deli hearing the stupid fucking K-Rock contest. Like, you know, win the tickets to go see the No One Knows band in fucking Las Vegas. You know, I'd be like, wow, that'd be kind of cool. Like, I'm so I was so psyched because it was like, like the White Stripes, the Strokes were getting on K-Rock and then you would hear No One Knows on like K-Rock, like every other song during that era, you know, like that Queens of the Stone Age got yeah. huge. And I was like, wow, oh, that'd be so cool, you know, like fucking making chicken parms and like washing dishes and shit, you know rise doing shows at like brownies and going on tour and coming in coming home and then something happened where turbo negro they were supposed to open for them on this run of shows and something happened with like the guys uh visa stuff and i don't know if we knew uh their booking agent from somehow along the way because he knew a lot of people that we knew but it was just that random thing where it was like Queens in the Stone Age want you to open for them for like three weeks. Oh man, it's like, that's what? amazing. <laughs> it's like, fuck. How did that happen? It happened from like, like just like whatever. It just bit. and we're like, yeah, of course, you know. And then we did that, and then from that tour, we got another tour where we were supporting uh, Mars Volta around that. Um, D Louse and the Comatorium tour, kind of okay. similar venues where we never played venues that big either, where it was like playing like 3,000 capacity theaters. Same kind of thing, just go out there, go as insane, crazy as possible so that people remember you. And like we were really tight. We're doing like, you know, 30 minute set or whatever it was. And then from there, um, I was, we were friends with, um, John Theodore, who was in the Mars Volta, he was the drummer of the Mars Volta. He's an old friend of mine from college, like the Trans Am connection. The band that he was in actually called Golden. I don't know if you know them. Both of the guitar players in that band are also incredible guitar players. Right. A guy named Ian Eagleson and uh, Alex Minoff. So then like okay. after doing the Mars Volta tour, I don't know how it happened or whatever it was. That's how we got, so we got signed to DreamWorks, which... Um, right during that era was like the end of you know the major label era where it became the conglomerate so then once we got signed to dreamworks the people were like who do you want to record your record and we're like i guess how about dave Grohl? that'd be like, fun right they're like sure let me get him on the phone he's gonna call you and fucking in tomorrow <laughs> i was like what <laughs> and then it was a thing where he Talked to him on the phone, hit it off. He's like, I love that Jersey Girls record. I love the stuff you did with, you know, the Albania recordings. He was like, let's do it. He, he was like, came to Soho. We like met him and had like coffee with him somewhere. And then like, you know, we were signed to DreamWorks in that fall. And then within like three weeks, we were out there with him recording. We had already written these like 14 or 15 songs like in this time, fully demoed and shit on our own. And then after we hit it off with him and met him, then we were um, out there by like the fall of 2003 recording at uh, Sound City, which was an amazing experience, but very different than anything we had ever done up until that point. And uh, he's a, he's such a fantastic person. I yeah, love... it was amazing. He was so generous. We learned so much just from like recording with him and how, you know, like just about yeah. the whole process and everything. It was like, and again, still being so young, hindsight is twenty twenty. Like I wish there was things that we would have did differently because you know, sure. being twenty six or twenty seven in that situation, we had no idea what the fuck we were doing. You know, what I mean? we've, like, we've we've been fortunate <laughs> enough to go on tour with him a few times, and he's still such a generous, genuine, amazing yeah. human being, and deserves everything that he has totally. because he's such a uh, just a fantastic guy, fantastic yeah. musician, and oh, and amazing. you know. Yeah, and I'm so happy to see you know they did their their Taylor uh, Hawkins tribute concert and that yeah that was you know, who knows who knows about the future but you know like I like I said before we were rolling that Chris Shiflett's been a long time friend of mine for a long time as well and you know it's just I love those guys all of them are such such good people I'm gonna we need a I I won't keep you on too much longer but I got a few more questions yeah. um so 
uh, amps, what what have you used amp wise? What were you using during all of this? You you keep referring to Marshall Super Leads. Was that something that you were? Yeah, I mean that would be like I was early on, like the early rise shit. I somehow came across again, like when I was mentioning, you could get a cheap amp, which for then was like 400 bucks or whatever it was. I would always be borrowing someone's amp or something like that. But I had one of those, uh, it was like a silver Jubilee series. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that? Dual chain, I have one of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I wish I never sold that thing, dude. Yeah. It has like the pullout on the on the gain or the preamp yep. setting. It was like either like, it was Slash endorsing those or something like that? Well, well Slash had those and then yeah. his, his signature model Slash had is the silver jubilee right. yeah. um that he sort of re like basically just to get the thing reissued and then right. they reissued the actual super jubilee with a little more gain in it for like updated yeah. standards and stuff and that's one of the ones i have i have one of the newer ones but you just answered my second question because i usually ask people what's the one that got away what's a guitar and piece of gear that you might have lost or yeah. sold or or that, in, pretty much i mean that maybe I your agree. blue your blue strat as well that too i kind of wish i still had that but i mean you can't you know like having the jubilee i had that for a while and then i had another um you know i had like a slant one of those like four by 12 marshall slant cabs and then like uh it was probably like a j is it a jmp it wasn't a super lead but it was like maybe a late 70s one right. marshall head that was just like an awesome indestructible workhorse thing and then like when it was just me and Ryan, like I would be running two marshals, like one on each side of the stage, with right? B box, and then later on, like you know, after doing the Sound City stuff or working with Grohl and seeing, like you know, oh, you can do uh-huh. all these different kind of combos to get like different kind of tones. Then it was like you know, having more. Like I had an OR one twenty, like with the DreamWorks Advance, like everybody got an equipment advance, which was like insane. Like everybody yeah. got like a couple grand and you could buy whatever you wanted. So I was like, I, I got an, a new OR120 in the, the, the cabinet, you know? Yeah. So I was like running a full, both me and Herb, the other guitar player, were both running an OR120 and a a super lead stack, like dual wow. stacks, which was like so stupid, but it was like, what are you going to do? Why not? I mean, <laughs> but, 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 but why, why, then, why wouldn't you? Well, so wait, yeah. so are you much of a pedal guy? Have you been much of a pedal guy? No, that's the thing. I always just wanted like a minimal kind of thing where I would either like for like the rise stuff later on, once we kind of, I would just use maybe just like any kind of fuzz box to get noise or like a lead boost. And then sometimes I would use, like, I was using this shitty, like, small stone, like, flange pedal. Right. But, I mean, for me, like, all I need, like, what I use now is, uh, I love the, um, I mean, I have an AC30. I have, like, a, I have a 66 Vibrolux now, like, that I don't really take out of the house. But, like, any kind of thing like that. I have a, a setup that's, it's not my cabinet, but it's my head, this Music Man uh, 135. Right. Through, a sound city four by 10 cabinet. Oh, right. So I would like run that with the AC 30 together. Sounds fucking great. And That's then, great. Uh, I have a 65 uh, Fender showman head, which is also awesome. If you just That's crank great. that thing, I just try to, I mean, I just like natural gain, you know, like sure. I don't like anything crazy, just like nice, something that breaks up nice. And then like, I, if I need like something extra, I love this uh, interstellar overdrive death by audio effects pedal. It's just like a gain pedal or like a, you know, it's just like a, like oh, a yeah, the, the death, the death by audio yeah. stuff is great. The awesome death stuff. Death. Or yeah. like I have a, um, like a phase 90, an original phase 90 that also somebody gave me and somebody mm-hmm. gave me those amps like the fender amps you know so i've face face 90 eddie eddie van halen you know you gotta have yeah it. exactly and, and then it's um, M- mxr and they mxr and jim dunlop sponsored this show so oh that's awesome uh, yeah shout and out. then like um the uh i use like a memory toy also like uh you know an electro harmonics little thing just to get noise like if i wanted to do like a feedback swell out or just right. to get some crazy noise going but that's it like i n- never use the pedal board like we would do those shows like the Foo Fighters took us on a couple week tour in Europe and we would just show up just us no roadie and the people would look at us 80 person crew like wait where's the rest of like you're gonna put all this stuff on this gigantic stage by yourself I did that tour with only that metal guitar too like literally one guitar 
you know, 20,000 capacity hockey arena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. And then just like uh, try to keep it as minimal as possible because you know what I mean? Like, I don't want too many variables or like crazy well, yeah. factors, you know, nothing worse than trying to troubleshoot like a signal chain malfunction when you're like about to start the show. Yeah. It's like oh, the no, worst, half, the half worst hour, feeling ever. And yeah. you got a half, a half hour set in the beginning, and you know, to exactly. begin with. Exactly. And, you know. Exactly, well, so, man. So, so one glance at your website, you're pretty prolific. I mean, you have a lot of records, out, a lot of bands. What currently you have thin ears. Am I wrong? Oh yeah. That's a, something that, that I started. That's pretty much just like um, friends of mine, Justin, who was in Rye Coalition and the Black Hollies band with me. And then my really good friend, Dennis Pierce, who's also an amazing guitar player, probably my favorite guitar player right. currently. It's his um, studio. His brother Andy plays drums, and Andy's bandmate and um, partner Stephanie Cooper also plays keys and sax and sings on it. But it's pretty much like instead of going to the voice memo graveyard, like ideas that I would never try to actually flesh out because I never felt confident as a singer. First of all, like I always felt like big time imposter syndrome, like trying to like flesh out as a songwriter instead of just like riffs putting riffs together on the sure. spot and like letting somebody else sing or do the singing thing so it's like um just something that is um comes together like that based on ideas or parts that i would like work on and then present to them because they're all amazing musicians and they'll basically learn it on the spot and we'll come up with some kind of tweaks for an arrangement that's like executable to get a nice live take of it. And then Justin and Dennis and Andy and Stephanie all help with like the producing and like the arrangement kind of right. ideas and just try to keep it as minimal as possible with regard to like the old way of recording, you know, like yeah, bounce some tracks down, nothing crazy. There's no pro tools or anything like that. And it's just kind of like, layering stuff on top of a live take and like just making it sound like what it sounds like if awesome. we were playing, you know? And then... Well, everybody be on the search and look out for thin ears. John. Yeah, thanks. John's oh, that's so yeah. cool. That's Absolutely. Awesome. Well, John, I'll let you go, man. We got, we, I've been, Thank you so I've, I've had you for over an hour now. So, oh, man. Thank uh, yeah, every, you so much. Everybody listening, check out Riot Collusion. If you haven't already check out John's new band, the thin, thin ears, not the thin ears, but thin ears. And uh, check out John in general, man. You have johnganelli.com. Oh, yeah. That's my personal site where I'm posting the, the thin ear stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, right. Thank you so much. Of course, so fun, buddy. Dude. Uh, all right, man. Well, hey, John, thank you so much, man. It was very nice to meet you, buddy. And uh, we'll talk soon. Likewise. Thanks, Zach.